Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Teaching with Mindly Learning. I have a question for you. How does teaching language arts make you feel? For so many of us, it makes us feel overwhelmed and not even sure where to begin. Or other times it just makes us feel like unsatisfied with our current language arts program because things just don't work or they don't fit together or it just doesn't feel like you know it should. Sometimes teaching language arts makes you feel tired because you're tired of the disconnected lessons that just don't seem to fit and as a result, tired of the disengaged students as well. Sometimes teaching language arts also makes you feel frustrated with having to find everything yourself and trying to fit it all together. Or it makes you feel worried because you're not exactly sure how teaching language arts, whatever school might look like this year, we're not exactly sure how that's going to all work out. So think about which one you are. Does the thought of teaching language arts, does it make you feel overwhelmed, overworked, frustrated, or uninspired? For me, I have been teaching for 13 years and I have taught a wide variety of grades from grades three to grade six, as well as working directly with ESL students. I've also been able to help thousands of teachers implement inquiry-based learning in their junior classrooms in a variety of subjects, including math, science, social studies, and language. But I'm also the busy mom of three real super cute kids, and I really don't want to miss them growing up because I'm busy planning and prepping in all of my free time after school. And as a teacher, over my career, I have learned and hold true to these three beliefs. I believe that if we want to have engaged students, we need to start putting them in the driver's seat. And I believe that a teacher's evenings and weekends should not be spent working for free, planning and prepping all of the time. Yes, some of the times it happens, but should we be giving up every minute of our free time in order to plan for what's happening in our classroom? Absolutely not. And I also believe that learning needs to be accessible to all of the students in our classroom. However, this all comes without overburdening the teacher to make that happen all on their own. Because the reality is, is that currently when we walk into empty classrooms with nothing there and we don't know where to start, feeling overwhelmed, overworked, frustrated, and uninspired is an often all too common feeling teachers have when thinking about their language arts program. It was a few years ago when I had two kids at home under three, I was looking at the potential of a class that had very disengaged students, both readers and writers. I remember the teacher from their previous year came to me and wished me good luck because they did nothing all year. I currently had felt uninspired with my language arts program and I felt frustrated because nothing seemed to work and I was constantly chasing a moving target that I never seemed to get ahead of. It was at that point that I knew there had to be a different way. I wanted to have a rigorous language arts program that engaged my students, that was designed for them so that they could be successful and they were motivated to actually do what needed to be done. There are so many different components of a language arts program that need to fit together to make it all work. And this is where the challenge lies. We have read alouds, shared reading, media literacy, shared reading, shared writing, listening, teacher-student conferences, spelling and grammar instruction, providing our students with feedback, giving them opportunities every day to write, making sure that they are using their speaking skills as well as guided reading, and giving them some time for independent reading. There are so many different components that need to go into successful language arts program that it's no wonder it feels overwhelming to figure out how they fit all together. But the reality is, is that you can have a language arts program that fits everything together and that you can engage students in learning their language skills each and every day all year long. But the question we want to answer is what exactly makes a good language arts program? Well, number one, we have to make sure that the things that we're doing in our classroom are rooted in research, that we know that these are the high yield strategies that are going to give us the best results for our students. We can find these in variety of places. We can read the guides to effective instruction here in Ontario, and they will give us the help and the roadmap, although sometimes complicated, as to what needs to be included. But here, let's go over what they say needs to be included in a highly effective language arts program. 
when we have a language arts program that is research-based, it means in the junior grades, we are focused on getting our students to dig a bit deeper and focusing on getting them to understand the text they read, what they're writing in a deeper meaning. It's all in the junior grades about meaning making. And in order to do that, we need to connect learning to the students' prior knowledge because they're not just learning in a vacuum. We need to make it available to them and connected to what they already know. We need to be focused on developing their higher order thinking skills, their application, not just on knowledge and understanding. What we absolutely do not want in a language program is kids that can go through the motions and the learning goes in one ear and out the other. If they forget it five seconds after walking out of your classroom, then there is something missing in what we are doing in our room. We also need to make sure that learning is scaffolded. Learning in literacy is developmental and students are all over the map in where they are. So making sure that our learning is scaffolded so that students can access the work in whatever capacity they happen to be right now, that is what we're focusing on. But the reality is we can read the research, but we need to know what that actually means when we're in our classrooms planning our lessons. So what does having a strong literacy program look like that is research-based? Well, it means focusing on things like just summaries because we want to have them take a complex test and focus on what was this really about? Not just retelling and regurgitating the facts in an order, but really synthesizing the information and summarizing it into a very small, unique, tidbit of information. We also need to be focused a lot more on inferential understanding, getting kids to understand theme, deeper meaning, that inferential connections, so that they're not just finding similarities, but they're actually digging a little bit deeper in between the words to make those connections, inferences, and understanding the theme of the things that they're reading and also writing. Using Bump It Up boards are a great scaffolded way to help your students understand the language of assessment. We need students to know what it is they're expected. We need to make that very visual and very real for them. A Bump It Up board is a visual way to look at the levels of achievement and have students tie what work looks like and what is expected of them explicitly that they can work through and compare their work to. It also means that yes, even in the junior grades, we still are going to be focused on guided reading. This is an important component of the junior literacy program. However, it is a little bit different from primary. While primary guided reading is often focused on things like fluency and decoding skills, guided reading at the junior level is much more focused on meaning making and getting our students to understand how to understand the text. Also using things throughout the day as individual conferences where we are meeting with our students, reviewing what they're working on and providing them timely and relevant feedback is going to be an imperative part of your research-based literacy program, especially in the junior grades. Now, how do we get that all out? Now, we want to make sure that we are scaffolding our learning through using what's called the gradual release of responsibility. This means that we understand that students are not ready to just simply jump into an independent task before we show them how to do it. It means that we need to model the learning that needs to happen, share with them the opportunities for them to do the learning with us as they follow along. We also need to engage our students in guided instruction through small group learning, as well as moving them into independent work. This is especially true when we're getting them to dig a little bit deeper. We need to explicitly show them how to do this. We cannot just assume that giving students a text, they'll automatically be able to dig a little bit deeper. We need to use the modeled, shared, guiding, and independent practice throughout the year in a spiraled approach that allows us to work our students through these stages to get them from not knowing to knowing. In the classroom, what does that actually look like? It means we can use picture books. Yes, picture books, even in the junior grades, because we can get a wider variety of experiences through these picture books. We can also model our thinking with the support of those visual pictures inside the picture book to really allow them to see beyond just the text and model with them how to think a little bit deeper. These books are accessible and easy for you to be able to begin to model these deeper 
type thinking strategies with your junior students. It also means that we need to teach them how to dig into a text and teaching them that annotating their text while they read a shared reading passage is a great experience to do. Reading is an active process and getting them to annotate the text that they are looking at and mark up where they're making connections, when they find words they don't understand, getting them to really dig apart that text and getting them to understand it at a much deeper level is a great way when we use the annotation tools. It also means that we need to really focus on that metacognitive piece and get students to start listening to their thinking. There are so many students that just read a text and aren't really thinking about what it is they're doing in their brain. Teaching them that metacognitive process and understanding what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what their process is to be successful, really getting them to listen to their thinking, understanding what's happening, and that metacognitive piece is also a really great way to model, share, and guide your students towards their independent practice. We all know that what a child can do today with assistance, she'll be able to do tomorrow by herself. And this is so important as to why we need to scaffold that instruction and walk our students through by explicitly showing them how to dig through a text deeper. We also know that strong literacy programs are differentiated. I don't know about you, but in my last 13 years of teaching, not once have I ever had a class where all of the students in the room were working at the same level. This is even more true when it comes to literacy. Students are all across the map in their skills and ability levels, which is why if we are planning a literacy program, we don't want to have to plan seven different types of literacy activities for all the varied levels in our classroom. What we do need to do is focus on open-ended and accessible activities for both the 90% of our kids that can access them. We are always going to have students in our room that are going to need additional support and they're going to need one-to-one -one support for far more often. But if we can move more of our students into independent practice, we actually will have time to work with those few students in our room that need us the most. By using open-ended activities that are accessible to almost all of your students, this is the way we can do it. Allowing things like student choice and voice and autonomy to allow them to make their decisions will keep them engaged and will make sure that your learning is flexible. More students can access when they have opportunities to be able to do something that is relevant and meaningful to them. So what do we do in the classroom? Well, you'll see in the image here, if you're watching the video, that we can use choice boards for reading and writing. Reading response choice boards where students are asking and answering questions on a variety of different comprehension skills, recognizing that not every student is going to rely on the same comprehension skill for the same text, giving students an opportunity to choose the question that is most relevant to them when answering about a text that they've read is a great way to open up that task and allow more choice and autonomy for students. Same with writing. We don't have to follow this kill and drill mentality of writing units where we decide what they're going to write, when they write, and how they're going to write. We can allow our students to use an inquiry perspective in learning to understand that they don't need to have all of the answers before they try to write a research report. They can experiment and learn and explore the concept of writing a research report or a biography or a speech or a diary using their own background knowledge and beginning to experiment with different writing forms that are topical and relevant to the subject they want to write about. Using goal boards is another way to differentiate for students. Understanding that students are on a continuum and each student may have a different goal is a great way to use goal boards in your classroom. Students individually monitor their own thinking, their skills, their processes, and choose a relevant goal on the goal board. While every student has a goal, each student's goal may be slightly different. This allows you as the teacher to tailor your feedback for individual students based on the goal they happen to be working on. And this also gives us an opportunity to provide frequent feedback for our students because we know that students need to know how they're doing. We need to know that the improvement that they make is based on the feedback that we tell them and inform them about. Another strategy is also using responsive spelling lists. Students need to actually have the ability to learn how to spell and write in context of what they're actually writing. 
So therefore, if we are going to use spelling lists in our classrooms, the idea is that we need to use spelling lists that allow us to have students choose the words that they are misspelling, the words that they are struggling with. So using the words that they're misspelling in their own writing, use subject-specific vocabulary that they're learning, whether that's in science, social studies, or math, and allowing students to say, this is the reason I'm choosing this word. It's not just a random list of words the teachers gave me that I can go through. I put this word on my spelling list because it's important that I learn how to spell it because I keep spelling it wrong. Then we can evaluate students as they practice spelling those specific individualized words. We can then evaluate students on their improved spelling within their writing because there is a connection, a direct connection between why they are practicing certain words and what they're spelling in their own writing. We also know that a strong literacy program is collaborative. We need to create a community in our classroom of learners where we look at having them trust each other and share their work and it is a risk-free environment. We know that students talk is important. They need to be able to talk about what they're learning. They need to be able to share with others what they're learning. Creating a community that is a safe space for them to share something so personal as writing. To share their own thinking and opinions about what they're reading, we need to have a community in our classrooms of trust. One where students can take risks and there isn't a huge amount of risk that's going to be involved where they are afraid of failure. So they don't take the risks because they're afraid of failure. We also want to make sure that our learning is collaborative and that we have flexible groupings in our room so that we can tailor our instruction through guided learning through not just on ability levels but also on student need. How do we do that? It means we can build into our regular center's rotation things like peer editing time. We can use knowledge building circles that we're familiar with using in science and social studies, and we can put that into our language where we do not have to be the expert in the room as the teacher, that we can allow students to build knowledge from one another and learn from one another. One of the most valuable activities that can be done in a classroom is focusing on students' strengths as readers and writers and allowing them to share that strength with others and recognizing that there may be someone who's got a really strong voice in their writing and sharing that strength with somebody who that's their goal. So if you have a student in your room that is writing with lacking voice when they're writing or lacking creativity in their word choice, but yet you have another student in your room where that is a strength, partnering those students up and allowing them to build knowledge with each other on their strengths and sharing something they're good at, all of the learning doesn't necessarily need to come from us as the teacher. It also means that we explicitly need to teach our students how to talk to one another. Students don't often know how to have higher order thinking academic conversations with one another. They know how to talk to each other informally out on the playground about things, but they don't know how to have an academic conversation. Teaching them explicitly how to talk to one another, how to ask questions, how to further, how to provide feedback. These are all great skills to be able to use in your classroom when you are focused on collaborative learning. Another activity is getting your students to share, do a shared writing activity and writing together. Two students have different strengths as writers, partner them up and allow them to work together to show each other the process and have them scaffold that process together so that they can rely on each other's strengths to be able to accomplish the goal and learn new skills. Finally, a strong literacy program is transferable and enduring. We know that in order to make our learning relevant for our students, we need to be able to connect the ideas across the curriculum stand, strands. We need to be able to make sure that the things that we're reading in our classroom are not just irrelevant to our students. We need to bring the world into our classroom. We need to focus on using inclusive, diverse texts from around the world with different topics, different characters, different perspectives, making sure that the texts that we're using are serving as windows, prisms in our students' worlds. 
We need to be able to embrace an inquiry-based learning pedagogy in our rooms to understand that students can experiment, can explore, that learning doesn't just happen in six-week chunks, but we have an entire 196 days with our students in which to accomplish the goals of the curriculum. We also need to focus on the strengths of our students to make sure that we are looking at where they are strong, where their needs are, and how we can how we can move them ahead on the journey that they are individually on. In the classroom, what does that look like? It means we're going to try a spiraled instruction approach. It can get mucky, it can get messy because it does take a little bit longer to gain that mastery, but we know that the mastery they do benefit from using a spiraled approach is going to be much deeper and more transferable than what they would typically do if it's the kind of kill and drill mentality of here, learn this task, accomplish the assignment and move on to the next unit. We want our students to be able to remember what they did in November and apply it to what they're doing in May. We also, so that's why we're moving away from these standalone units where we're just going through the motions as teachers and checking off expectations from the curriculum. It doesn't work for students. We need to be able to extend the application of literacy skills into the content areas, not necessarily bringing the content areas into our literacy program, but using the application of the skills that we are teaching our students in our literacy block and extending those into the content areas. So if you are typically given 500 minutes for literacy in a week and 300 minutes for your content areas, that means that you are extending your literacy into those 300 minutes and using things like texts within your science program as shared reading, as double dipping. So not just one shared reading in a day, but maybe two because you've got your shared reading that's tied to your literacy, but you're also applying that annotation skills and all of that into your content areas as well. So you're extending literacy into those areas. It also means it is vital that we are bringing social justice topics into our classrooms, that we are not avoiding the difficult conversations that we are having. We are making sure that our students are represented not only in the texts, in the activities, and in the things that are happening in our room. We want to relate what is happening in our literacy classroom to things in the outside world so that they will go home and see the relevance of what we are doing in class to their world outside of our four walls. By using these strategies, you can have a rigorous language arts program that engages your students. I'd love to hear in the comments of the video or wherever you are watching this podcast or video replay, I would love to hear what high yield strategy you want to implement more in your classroom coming this year. Drop it in the comments and share. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Teaching with Madly Learning. We will be back next week for another episode. Bye for now. If you are struggling to figure out how to plan and schedule your language arts program from what it looks like Monday to Friday versus what it looks like every hundred minutes that you sit down to teach your students in language arts, then I want to invite you to check out the video at www.ignitedliteracy.com forward slash masterclass 2021. And from there, you will be able to find this video where I walk you through from beginning to end how exactly I structure my literacy program every single week and every single day. From how long it takes me to do modeled reading, shared reading, guided reading, independent reading, how I structure my centers. It really is the A to Z guide to how to structure and plan your language arts. So again, if you want to check that out, you can go to www.ignitedliteracy.com forward slash masterclass 2021.